Let's start with a question to the audience. Who uses UST in production? Sort of, almost, uh, yeah, I like those shy hands, yes. I, let's, say, let's say yes, right? Now more rhetorical questions. How successful has it been? Or how challenging was it to fit into your pipeline or make it work for you, right? Because the reason why I'm asking those questions is because it was tough for us to implement it uh, in the pipeline. And even if USD is open, it's not necessarily standard. And we've seen uh, all the efforts this year to standardize practices. I think that to start your uh, USD journey, Solaris is the best application out there. I also think that Solaris is great, a great package for a multi-shot work, especially for lighting. And this talk is all about explaining key USD concepts, doing some demos of workflows, how we can apply this in practice. And I also want to promote, promote further reflections for artists and devs, because I'm sure that people here are either one or, or both, right? And I, I want you to, at the end of this talk, have ideas to implement in your pipeline. So look for those icons throughout the presentation for artists and uh, pipeline reflections. So who am I? I'm LP, Chris said that already. Um, I'm head of CG for Folks Montreal and Sagne. Uh, I also CG soup shows, I train artists at work, I code whenever I have time, and I mentor students at uh, NAD School in Montreal. There are great artists there. If you haven't seen their stuff, uh, look it up. Folks um, is all around the world. I work uh, for the Sagne and Montreal offices, uh, and Folks is part of it, the Pitch Black Company, which is a collection of brands. We can see them. Uh, you probably already know them, but here they are, Fuse FX, Rising Sun Pictures, Folks, and El Ranchito. So we'll first recap what we did last year, and you're like, what, what happened last year? We'll get there. Uh, We'll recap what we did last year, um, and I'll, I'll explain some theory and go into more in-depth workflows, right? So who remembers this? Yes, thank you. Uh, the good answer was everyone, right? Because you, <laughs> you, you all attended last year's presentation. Why I'm referring to that is because last year we had this, cleaning up the bar. Now it's, we're lighting it up. It's a continuation. Uh, we, we worked on the side effects uh, bar scene that was released in 2018. I think I got it in the previous slide here. Yeah, 2019, sorry, for Houdini 18. Uh, so it was released with the first release of Solaris. Uh, we have to remember that Solaris was first announced four years ago at SIGGRAPH. It's already been four years. And the scene was made... Um, it was all USD asset, but they were not necessarily following any standards. And we just talked that they are not necessarily standards, but there are some good practices that are already established. If we think at the ASWF working group, uh, there are some recommendations on how to build assets. And if you've used the component builder, uh, then you probably already created your asset correctly, yay. Uh, so what we did last year, we used PDG to uh, to look at all the files that were already made by the uh, marketing team at SideFX. We converted some of them, uh, cleaned them up. Uh, we created the, the structure, right? The scene graphs, the primitives and all of that with the component builder. And it was all about creating those assets, those components and uh, assembly models. So what we're trying to do this year is to build shots with those assets, right? So all these assets right there. And in the meantime, like a, a good uh, uh, cooking show, right? I come up with some already uh, baked uh, results. We also added a character uh, and a few other props that we didn't work on last year, but that are, were needed for this year's presentation. The idea is that we will release all the content, the USD scenes and the work files. I know I said that last year, but since no one was there, I can't be held accountable, I guess. Uh, yes, okay, good. Uh, but this year, this fall, we will release all the USD scene, uh, the USD uh, assets and the, the work scenes. Uh, so it's available for the community. Um, 
So when starting for this year, we, we decided to do this production simulation. We wanted to set some, like, some constraints. What, what are, are our guidelines for the shots we want to build? I wanted multiple shots. We decided three was, it counted as multiple shots. Uh, I want a sequence lighting and I want different caches like cameras, uh, animation caches and FX caches per shot. Then we will build the sequence, the shots together. So here's the shot that we will look at specifically. That's shot 30. So we have three shots in the sequence, 10, 20, and 30. And that's the one that got rendered in time. Yay, 30. Um, let's start with the shot or the, the idea of root layer stacks. I think this, uh, this could also have been called how to collaborate using USD. So let's recap and start with the building, building block of USD, primitives. So primitives are the fun fundamental building blocks of USD. They form hierarchical structures, parent-child relationships between them. And then on top of those, we have properties. Properties are named and type data. On the primitives, we have attributes. So attributes are direct values that may vary over time. And we have relationships, which are uh, ways to point to other primitives. For example, a camera in the render settings. In your render settings, you might be pointing to a camera. So that's another primitive. So that's a relationship. Same thing for material binding. You're pointing to a, a material primitive. So that's also a relationship. It counts as a property. Then we have paths, right? It's, it shows the precise location of a primitive or a property. Property also have paths. And um, in the scene hierarchy, or what we refer as the scene graph tree, or the namespace, sometimes you would hear that as well. Um, and the, um, there are like file path on disk, right? When you browse your network or your own computer, you, you find a file on disk and it has a path, so it, it really behaves the same way. And we're used to paths in Houdini, right? Uh, operators also have paths, so we're used to that idea. Then we have layers. Layers are like bundles of primitives uh, with their own properties. They contain opinions and they specify these elements like the, the primitives. They can exist purely in memory, like with anonymous layers, and they, they are meant to be saved and loaded uh, from disk. Then the layer stack. Remember, we're, we're going through all of these because we want to explain what the root layer stack is, so it's important to understand the layer stack here. Um, for a given layer, there are sub-layers, so you can say that those sub-layers contribute to that layer's layer stack. Uh, it is the ordered collection of contributing layers uh, internally maintained by this specific layer. And finally, the root layer stack, it is the layer stack to rule them all. Um, it is highly beneficial for fostering collaboration workflows in USD. Uh, within the root layer stack of an asset sequence or shot, cooperating departments or artists can manage their own layers. Uh, as a result, they work sem seamlessly. Uh, they can combine their work together. And it, it creates, a, um, it creates a, a situation where everyone has a sandbox. Everyone has a common scene des description and they, they don't have to rebuild their own, uh, their own scene, right? The uh, uh, established workflows uh, I've been using or established pipeline uh, might use scene builders, but here you have a, a, a cached out scene description, right? So that's the, uh, the benefit of our root layer stack. So you always have to manage these two ideas, the primitives, so the scene graph, and the layers. And I think it's easy in Solaris sometimes to forget about the layers uh, because they're dynamic. You, As you create new nodes, you create new layers, and sometimes you might lose track of them. But always come back to the, the, the root, uh, not the root, sorry, but the, uh, the layers. There is a layer pane where you can see them all and see how they interact with one another. So always a good idea to manage the two. But at the same time, it could be automated by your pipeline. So here are three shots. At least, at least I was able to render a frame of each. Um, so for these three shots, there are some things that are common to all the shots. And with these common elements, we can decide how we will nest these into the maybe project sequence and shot layer stacks. 
So here's an example of a shot layer stack. The, name, the names of those department or pipeline step are not really important. It might be different in your pipeline. That's just one example. And I'll start at the bottom with the weakest layer and I'll work my way up in the stack. Um, so we have at the bottom the project or show layer. Uh, you could set different things that are global for the entire project. Maybe you want some AOVs or render bars or render settings come in across all the projects. So you could store them here. Same thing for the next one just above, the sequence layer. But it's also in the sequence that you, or we will establish the look, uh, the lighting look for the entire, uh, for the three shots. Uh, but many things can live in the sequence layer and we'll have a whole section about this. Then all the blue uh, layers, they are really specific to the shot. I start with the manifest, so maybe this is not common uh, amongst many pipeline, but that's an idea I like. Uh, having the manifest layer, or just you could call it also uh, casting or call sheet, it's a way to have to bring in all your models uh, in one layer and have it maybe separate from layout. Other pipelines might prefer to merge that with the layout layer, uh, but it's a good way to have all your reference of models in at the same place. Uh, layout, or you could call it maybe set dressing. Uh, you might want to export uh, transformation on the primitives. Uh, as I said, you could also merge it with the previous, the, the manifest layer. And it's also where you could store in the camera and thing like this. Animation for animation caches, wherever they're coming from. Uh, FX are for FX caches. In this case, I don't have a CFX layer, but really it, it depends on your pipeline. But I'm just explaining that uh, as you go in the stack, it, it, it will be stronger than the layer before. Lighting for lights, uh, render geometry options or uh, render geometry settings also. And then I like having this prime layer and maybe it's not the best name, prime, main, head, superior, the, the best layer. Uh, just so when you're not able to troubleshoot something and not necessarily able to come back to one of these layer, you have a, an opportunity to, to have an opinion that will be stronger than anything else. So I like having this open. Usually I don't edit it, but it's a, a, good, a good thing to have it ready. So think about, as an artist, what layers would be relevant for your pipeline and in what order. And for developers, can you make it somehow, I wouldn't say dynamic, uh, but configurable per project, per sequence, maybe you want to reorder them, uh, but when they are established, they are fixed and it's important to know which one comes after the, the next. So now let's expand and see how we can insert stuff in those layers. So see on the left, we have the, uh, the bar uh, itself. So bar 30 is, the, uh, is one of the shot. And we, here we, in the manifest, sorry, we start with the project and the sequence. And see here the sequence on the right, we have uh, all the elements that we, that we want to load or that are common throughout uh, the three shots. So in this case, I have the dishcloth model, the mannequin model, the bar model. They're all important in that uh, manifest layer. Then on top, I set some X forms. For example, the mannequin, when I imported it, was at, at the center of the scene and I wanted to move it back behind the counter. And I have my light rig for the entire scene here. So all of this nests inside the sequence layer. And then on top of that, I have all the other layers for my shot. One way to keep track of versions on the root layer stack is the following. So as you contribute to the root layer stack, uh, you version it up every time. So you could say someone uh, creates the manifest layer, we import some of these references, we create a V1 of manifest, and then we create layer stack V1. And as you continue through these different steps, so you might have multiple people working in parallel, now someone picks, uh, picks up the entire layer stack, creates the layout V1, and now we have a layer stack V2. So that could be a good option. And then as you keep pushing, publishing these, uh, these changes, you increment the layer stack. You could also hold on some changes before releasing them and sort of building a layer stack. So instead of doing a v, V1, V1, V2, V2, you could say, okay, 
uh, I worked on manifest with V1, and as an artist, I will continue with my own content, work on layout V1, and maybe lighting V1, and then I release everything at once, or I publish them individually, but then I only build the layer stack once. So either from a UI or a command, maybe your command line based, and you can, uh, you could say, okay, build layer stack, and it looks at all the published layers, find them, combines them, and then increments the layer stack at this point. So it's really up to you to decide how you want to, uh, to increment those. Now building the sequence. The first layer was the manifest layer, but here your role is to import models as references. What did I hear? Huh? <laughs> what are models? Good question. Uh, so models are a special type of primitive that are more than just geometry. Uh, I come from Softimage XSI, and we had this uh, neat file format called EMDL, right? And it's similar to probably Maya MA or other file formats where it's like a small scene. The model is everything that will, uh, that contributed to the asset. Uh, the first and foremost model quality is its kind. It, it is a metadata on, on the model. And kinds are exclusive to models. And we'll see some scene graphs just after, but let's hear that. Kinds are exclusive to models. And there are some kinds that we already know. Components, we built the component with the component builder, uh, assemblies and groups. And assemblies are just fancy groups, so I could just say groups and it, it combines the two. And subcomponents, uh, usually it's when you want to nest an existing comp uh, a component in an existing component, uh, but let's just pretend they don't exist for now and stick to components and groups. There are three rules about uh, models. The first rule is you don't, you don't talk about models. No? Okay. The first one is only group model prims can have other ch uh, model children. Okay, then the second one is a prim can only be a model if its parent prim is also a group model. So they sort of work together, right? Your children must be models and your parents must be models. Good. Then the third one is no prim should have the exact kind model. It is sort of an abstraction. It shouldn't be called like that. You can, you can find if a primitive is a model with these calls, right? As an artist, you probably use VEX more than Python or other languages, so you can use USD is model or USD kind. So the first one will return true or false, the other one should return you a uh, component group, so the exact kind, uh, but there are also calls in the uh, Python API. I know you don't have Houdini open and you can run these tests, but let's see, we'll play a game. Is this a model, right? So I have three situations for you and then I'll reveal the answers. First one, is mannequin a model? Right there, just a man the model, it's a component at the root of the scene. Second one, is mannequin one here a model? So it was referenced in under two other primitives called assets and character. And here, the third one, very similar, but what I wanna know is which one is a model. So again, it was inserted with a reference uh, lop, and they have assets and characters, but they are a little different from the example before. So everyone, you have your answers in mind? So, we can see the first one is true. The mannequin, the component at the root of the scene is a model, good. Because it has no parent, it's at the root, we're fine. Second one, it turns out it's not a model. It has a component, but it's not a true model. When you run USD is model, it will return false. And here we can see uh, it's because the parents were not groups, they were just X forms. There were no kinds set on those that were not models. So because the parents were not models, this one can't be a model. And then for 3A and 3B, they're both through, true. It was a trick question, but there's still a difference. And maybe it's too small here, so I'll go back here. 
Uh, but you can see that it's not because they were they are set as models and they are they have a kind that they can't have a type. So in the example above, it, they are X forms and the example below their scope. So these groups uh, in the example below, they can't be moved in space, which is what I wanted to do in the long run. But it's important to understand that uh, uh, the kind and the type are two different things. All right, everyone had all three good answers? Yes, excellent. So how do you reference them in? So it could be automated, but let's say you're, uh, you're in Houdini, uh, you probably want to use a reference lop, and then you can use the slider uh, for the number of copies, right? Because you might want to bring more than one copy of the character. In my case, I only had one, but that nice slider can let you create more copies. I also like to add a suffix uh, for an ID, like a, a padded number. I start with 0, 0, 0, 1, and then as I increase them, it, they, keep, uh, they keep incrementing. Uh, if you don't start with a number, then your first one is like number less, and then the other one has one. It's just a matter of preference. And then you can go to the, um, to the composition or created primitives. So there's this uh, option of created primitives, and then you can set the parent as scope, and then you can uh, force the, uh, the component that you're bringing in as a component, even though it's already a component, you sort of force it, and then all its parent will become groups, so now it will be a valid model. So putting any sorts of help you here. Um, yeah. As a developer, how could you help the artist set the, uh, the references maybe outside the application? It could be a standalone application. It could be with your asset management system. You already have a way of saying which asset are in which shot or sequence. Um, and also you can think about extra primitives or metadata that could be useful, right? Uh, at this stage, you might want to create a camera already or wait for, uh, for the layout layer. Talking about the layout layer, uh, this is the first step that could or must be uh, handled by, uh, by an artist. The previous one, as we said, could be automated. But it's important when you work on these other layers that you don't start from, um, you don't start from the previous published layer, but from the layer stack entirely. So you load in the layer stack and then you work on, uh, on your layout. Here, my layout is fairly simple. I use uh, transform lobs to move things around. But what's in interesting is that first section here at the top. I have three key components. I have the sublayer to bring in the layer stack or the root layer stack. And then I have the layer break. I think we all understand what the layer break is. Everything above that, the layer break won't be saved into the, the file that you're trying to save downstream. So that's fine. But there's this one uh, right of the switch. Uh, this is a configure stage, and in the configure stage, you can pinpoint a layer that you want to mute. Why is it important is if you're working on layout V1, there's no, there no opinion uh, or previously uh, expressed opinion on the, uh, on the layout, so you're fine. But as you work on V2, 3, and 4, you already have those other layout opinions in the layer stack. So you might be doubling the effect. I like talking about nodes in applications like Houdini, Nuke, and all of that as signal. Let's imagine you're playing guitar, an electric guitar. Your input is the instrument, and the output is the speaker. If you add a, uh, an amplifier to gain up the signal, and you save that out, now you have a louder signal. But if you bring that back into the system, and it runs through the, the same pipe, it will be increased again. So if you want a cons uh, the, the same output, you need to mute the gain, and then you can add other modules, like maybe distortion, a little wah-wah pedal, something like that, and then you export that out. And when you bring it back into the system, you need to mute it again so you don't double up the effect. So this is quite important. 
maybe a developer could automate this process or at least encapsulate this into an HDA where as you load in the, uh, as you load in the layer stack, you are already in a context, so you probably already have a, a pipeline step where you, that you will be outputting to, and as you import the layer stack, you mute that one. So you're in the layout task, for example, you load the layer, the, the layer stack, it mutes the layout layer, and then you can continue working. And for the layout work, well, you can use uh, XForms, as I was saying, or transform lops here to move things around. You can also set the variance. If uh, your mannequin, for example, had many variants, ours uh, has uh, only one, uh, but you can set, for example, mannequin one is, uh, has this variant, the other one has another variant, so it's a good place to set those. Notice something here about the transforms, right? Uh, there's this xform up attribute, so it is here. Can you see my mouse? No, all right, it's fine. Lower left corner, right here, I'm about to click, right? So these two attributes are, or properties are quite interesting. Um, the transform lop will add automatically the suffix for, with the name of the operator so that you can stack multiple transform one after another and they're all saved individually. And then there's this other uh, property called xform up order that will let you combine multiple transform operations together. So you can sort of have a, a history of transform and only pick one or pick multiple, they will combine together. And it's important to know that this uh, exists and that it has a, a full name. It will be important when loading caches later on. For lighting, um, it's great because all of our assets are already looked at at this point, right? We worked on this together last year. Um, so now it's all about setting the look for the sequence. Many components were made with lights. We have many lamps, so we have the ceiling lamps. We can see all of the, the icons right now, right? Uh, the table lamps, they, they already have those, uh, those lights. So as we were placing them in the assembly, they came with the lights, so we get a first pass for free, but it's not exactly what we want. It needs a little more oomph. So that's what we do here in this, at, at the sequence level. So you can add light primitives, of course, a uh, set of base properties like exposure, intensity, color, temperature. You can set other shaping properties, maybe light contribution. Also set your LP tags for light groups, depending on your render. And uh, keep in mind that uh, environment or dome lights, they need a separate, uh, they, they need a separate lock because they are a different primitive in USD. One thing that is super powerful is to use classes. As we were setting up our components last year, we created those classes. And a class has a inherit um, composition arc. So now we can select any of those lights and then right click on them and edit not the primitive exactly, but its class. Uh, classes are ignored during a default stage traversal, so you might not see them at first but as you right click and edit them, they will appear. And from there, you have a sort of global override for all the copies of this primitive or this class, because all the table lamps share the same class. As you change the color on the class, all the table lamp will change color together. But it's important that uh, to remember that in uh, the liver piece world, uh, local or sublayer arcs are always stronger than the inherit, which means that if right after editing the class, you add an other, uh, an other light uh, operator and you edit one, ex one copy of the table lamp, because, because this will be a local edit, it will be stronger than the class edit. So you could say all the lamps in the room are red, except this one, it will be blue. So I think it's quite powerful, but just something to keep in mind. Uh, texture caching. The viewport uses the GPU extensively, uh, especially when displaying textures. So if you ever load this scene and you, you keep all the textures, depending on your graphics card, you, you might end up reaching the, uh, 
the cache limit. So something that I would recommend is to keep an eye on your GPU usage. Here, I use the ter terminal to monitor the GPU activity, uh, but you can either go to the top menus, Windows, caching, or cache manager, and then open GL texture and clear that out. If this is not enough, go directly to the uh, display options in the viewport, and there, there, there is this option to clear the textures, and it'll loop again, or I can skip a little bit this part. Apparently, I can't. Um, but it might take a second or two, but eventually it will clear up uh, the, uh, the entire texture cache, but something to, uh, to keep an eye on. So now that we established everything that we needed in our sequence, it's time to build the shot. We remember that the sequence is part of the shot layer stack. So we already have everything that we did so far for free, right? It's included. But we might want to add more stuff or even remove. Uh, here, usually we would add more elements, like we might want to add models in, in our specific shot because we establish only the models that are common to all shots in, uh, in the sequence to begin with, but there's also a possibility to remove uh, references. But I hear you say, hey, LP, uh, usually we can't really remove stuff in USD, right? Uh, it is possible, but there's a, a, a slight artifact. Let me explain. And with this story, you can also see many debugging tools are, they're not really debugging tools, they're more debugging workflows. But let's, like, let's have a look at this. So I first selected the primitive that I wanted to remove. Uh, it's not really the primitive that we will remove, it's a layer, but let's see. So I select it, then uh, under here in the scene graph layers, I can see uh, that primitive has opinion expressed on all those layers. You can see that they start all white here, and as I select the prim, I can see different shades of orange, so I can see where the opinions are expressed, and that way I can find where uh, the, uh, the asset was brought in to begin with. So it was in the sequence manifest layer, I can find the exact layer, and then I can copy this layer and enter it in the, uh, in the composition, We'll see that again. Uh, but the third tab of the, um, the, the reference lop here, I can remove the, uh, I can remove the, the layer from, uh, from the, the list. So the idea is that the manifest has a, a list of references. And by using this option here, remove reference, we just shorten that list. And there are a few composition operations. Append, which means adding that reference to the end of the list. Usually it means that it is the weaker option. Prepend is there by default because as you add stuff to the, uh, to the list, you want them to be included. So that's why it's prepend by default. And as we just saw, you can also delete, which means they're removed from the list. So they're not part of the layer stack anymore. The problem is it leaves a nasty, uh, nasty empty prim behind. So I'm not necessarily recommending to remove primitives but, or layers like this, but it can be done. For the animation layer here, um, I'm loading two different caches. Uh, let's focus on the glass first. The glass has already transformed opinions on the sequence uh, layer expressed. So if I come and try to sub-layer versus referencing the anim cache, I will get different results. Again, think about liver piece. If I try with the reference and insert it exactly at the same path, I'll see that I'm not able to get the, the, the cache exactly. So it will be layered and we can see on the lower left side. So as I select here, I wonder if I can at least pause. Um, we select this and then right there. We can see what elements are contributing to the, uh, the composition. So I think this is really strong when you select a primitive and then find the layer or find a specific attribute and you go to this section layer stack and you can see all the layers that contributed to that either primitive or that uh, property and find in what order they are composed. And you can see that with the reference and the sublayer, I get two different results. With the sublayer, the cache comes in 
under the previously established layout transforms, but with the sublayer, they're above. But then why use the reference in the first place? What I was trying to do is to insert the cache at a specific location, at a specific path in the namespace. But there's a way around this. If your cache already has the path primitive attribute in sublevel, you already have a, an attribute that you can use. If that path attribute in sub define the USD path, then you'll, you'll be able with a sublayer to just insert your cache at the right position. Ideally, you would work from a, the asset already inserted in your scene graph uh, with the correct path. Uh, what you get in is what you get out instead of working with the asset uh, outside the shot context, right? And here we can see that it's very similar when loading in a deforming cache. In this case, I have no conflict. Uh, the X form were at the component root, but the deforming cache is really on the geo, the geo, the geometry, so the meshes. And here there were no conflicts, so it just slots right in without any problem. Another game. <laughs> Can you tell me the difference between these two snippets? No? It's fairly. They're fairly similar, but one on the one on the left says def, and the one on the right says over. So def and over are two of the three specifiers. The other one is class that we talked about earlier. But the interesting thing with def and over is that if, as a developer, you decide to, or even as an artist, the way you save out your caches, FX caches, or a developer, how you set up the publish uh, the publish processes, you could. You could set those caches to either define or overlay uh, existing uh, primitives, which mean that if I come up with a cache with the define specifier and there is no model on which to apply it, it will just load it and it will probably be missing elements, right? As I was layering the deformed animation cache on the mannequin here, uh, there was the mannequin behind with all the textures, the UVs, and all that. But if I just bring in the the uh, if I just bring in the cache with the the define like this, it will just bring in the point position, missing all the key elements that make the mannequin the mannequin. But you could also set it to over. So if it does not find the matching elements, then it will just not overlay properly. And you've probably seen that if you set your USD ROP. So your output to define and you layer elements that are missing uh, other primitives, they're just, they are just brought in with a sort of red icon, meaning that you're missing some, some composition. It's assuming some, some elements were there and it's just uh, missing. And as a developer, you can also think about uh, when you're publishing the animation caches, because probably every, uh, every character will have a different animation cache how to combine those animation caches together so they are contributing to that animation layer and how you will layer that into the either shot layer stack or uh, sequence layer stack. Now that we, we built all the shots and, layer, uh, and sequence, it's time to set the render settings. And there are three key elements to understand. Those elements are in fact primitives. Your render settings are primitives in USD. So first you get your render vars, similar to AOVs or extra image planes, eh? for people using Mantra, extra image plane, yay. Um, they are shader output uh, or light path expressions. Yeah, then you get your render product. Um, it's usually what we refer as a render layer or render pass and it holds a list of render variables, right? So there's a, a sort of dependency here. Uh, the product name is the path of the rendered file on disk. That's important to understand. The name of the, the product name is the path of the rendered file on disk. And the render product must live under the render, um, the render primitive. And at some point, I, I remember asking uh, why, why render with an uppercase R when everything else might not be an uppercase? I just find it ugly that it was uppercase when everything else in my scene was lowercase and it was just not rendering, so uppercase R. Uh, 
And then render settings here, it's a general configuration for rendering, holds a list of rendered products and also must live under the render uh, primitive. So you can see render vars in render product and render product in render settings. And it looks like this. So you have the Karma render setting lock that will set everything for you, but you can see the sort of nesting dependencies, right? Uh, vars in product and product in render settings. And that Karma render settings lock is quite, quite nice. And it's similar somehow to the mantra wrap that we're used to. It has a lot of similar options, similar parameters like camera, rendering, sampling, resolution, output pictures, extra image planes, or in this case, render vars. Uh, but there are new stuff like the primitive name. I was talking about the product name, but here I'm really referring to the name of the primitive or its path. Um, the engine, in the case of uh, Karma, you can choose between CPU engine or XPU engine. Uh, but there are some things that are missing. If you're used to the image on the left, Mantra, or probably other solutions like Arnold or Renderman, I assume would have similar uh, user interface where you can set the, uh, the objects to force in the render, mat out, Phantom, or all of that. But the workflow is a little different in, in USD or at least in Solaris. Uh, the new workflow is to use these two, uh, these two nodes on the right, either the prune lop or the render geometry options lop. So to mimic something like force, you don't have much to do. What's in your stage will be rendered, so you don't have to force things. And then for mat, you go to render geometry options, shading, holdout mode, and then mat. And this is specifically for Karma. If you're using another render, the recipe might be different, but it's usually under the uh, render geometry options. For Phantom, similar story, but it's visibly the Phantom instead. And to exclude, you can either use the prune uh, lob to uh, set the visibility to off or even um, uh, or even deactivate the primitive, right? Again, you could make an HD out of that. Here we can see uh, elements in the render product. Uh, there are a few gotchas when these primitives uh, with these primitives, the resolution camera, and uh, the resolution and the camera might not be set. Uh, we can see here that uh, the render product uh, have the, the similar, similar properties as the render settings, but they are not set. If we look at the Karma render settings, they won't even set the relationship here. Uh, camera is empty and here there's a, the resolution was set to the fallback value of uh, 2048 by 1080. And the other gotcha is that if you have multiple render settings one after another, here I decided to use the air brakes to sp split them apart. Uh, they are divided in different layers. We can see that they each create a render uh, settings, but they, they compete for the same render product because they, they don't have the ability to set the render product name uh, specifically. So we have a problem when linking many render settings one after another. So how can we manage uh, setting the render settings for multiple shots? So one solution could be the context option. So if you're familiar with the Katana's uh, graph state variables, you should feel at home here. Uh, it's a pretty powerful system where uh, you can set global variables that are managed from the editor pane. And I, I like to think about this as like a command center for my, for my scene. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm only setting two uh, variables or context options, shot and render layer. So this could be your lighting file uh, where you manage uh, at the same time the sequence lighting and the shot lighting. So here it's the whole thing we talked about earlier where you bring in the, uh, uh, you bring in the, the layer stack, then you can set your sequence lighting here. I got a ROP node simply because you might want to publish it out. And then different shots, they have different lights. So you have your overrides here. The render settings, you, you have the different passes or layers one next to another, and you use the switches with an attribute. So here the attribute is called shot. So you can go and have at shot in the switch. 
And as you change here, because all my cameras are called render cameras, and that's something I like to do, all the cameras have the same name. So as you change the shot here, it's always the same primitive, but it just happened to be new properties on the render camera primitive. But you can switch from one camera to the other, and all the other changes come for free, right? The different light colors, the different positions, and all of that. So here's a, a very simple example just with the mannequin, but imagine that with a more complex scene. And it still works when rendering. And you can see here on the right, you can see that as I change the value of the variable, it also goes through the switch. And you can control the, the variables or the, sorry, the uh, context options, not only from that command center I was talking about, but directly in the node. Here we, you have the edit context options, but you could also set those in the USD ROPLOP or the USD render ROPLOP. Something to keep in mind that's quite interesting, but you can prepend or prefix the attribute with an uppercase C to make sure that they always resolve to the uh, to the variable coming from the context options because if you're using PDG to go through all your variables and maybe output your USD file, so you could create wedge uh, operators in PDG and say I have this list of shot, this list of uh, render layers, create a work item for each valid combination and then output the USD for each shot and render layer to disk, you don't want to have the context options and the PDG variables to compete to one, with one another. So you prefix the, uh, the context options variables uh, with a C and the ones from PDG with a P, uppercase P. And then you can see here, here how it looks. So in the switch, I use C and in the edit context options or the USD render up, I use uh, the P prefix. So here you can see how I use these, uh, these variables. And in the layer stack, you could also use the same variables directly in your layer stack and change the path on disk. Or maybe you're using another system, an asset resolver or some, some sort of thing. But you can use it not necessarily in a switch, but directly in the sublayer. Um, Let's think about other uh, context options that could help you deal with complexity. Maybe LODs, render setting qualities, and all that could be relevant to you. So now for rendering, we all know how to render directly uh, from the viewport. One thing you could do also is spacebar five to come into this image view so you have the proper framing. Sometimes you, you don't necessarily want to have the viewport tumbling options and you just want to see the 2D flat image. You can also render to employee. But at some point, you need to render it out, right? Render it on the farm. So you, one option could be to use the USD render ROP. But if you use the USD render ROP and you send it on the farm, you'll use the uh, a engine license throughout the entire rendering. I'm sure people at the back will be pleased if you, <laughs> you keep that token active throughout the whole rendering. But another option could be to use Husk. And Husk is a, a tool that ships with Houdini, and when you when you render with the uh, render uh, with the USD render wrap, it actually fires up a Husk process in the background, and you can monitor that process with the scheduler, or you can also pro uh, monitor it with the uh, with the logging system. But here's an example of a Husk command where you can uh, choose your render, uh, the render settings. Here, the make output path is quite important. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, but that's just an example. But you're probably better to read the documentation for Husk instead and run your, your test in, the, in a terminal. So you can test locally in a terminal and eventually send that to the farm. And if you want to know, hey, what renderer do I have access to and what are their exact name, you can uh, run uh, Husk dash dash uh, list render uh, list dash renders, and then it will eventually list you the available renders or husk dash dash help to have just the whole help, uh, or simply read the documentation. It depends how how you prefer to do it. And one thing to keep in mind, um, maybe create to create intermediate di directories would be better to be managed by the pipeline because there might be proper permissions. 
uh, groups to set on those directories. If it's not much of an issue for you, just use that flag make output path. So I want to thank people at work that helped me put this together, either in the content, ideas, and uh, as they say, that's all folks. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, for beginners, what resource do you recommend to learn the best practices for building assets for USD? Uh, first, the side effects website. Uh, there's a good section. There were two series recently, um, recently within the last two or three months that were released about the building assets. They're quite nice. And the ASWF uh, USD Working Group, uh, there is a uh, GitHub page, I think, with everything, or Confluence page. I'm not entirely sure. I think they keep moving it. Uh, but those would be your two resources. And the one on the side effects labs, they're quite easy to find. You go to uh, the top menus, learn uh, Solaris, and they should be right there. Maybe just one follow-up question. Yeah. What I find about USD is there are many rules that you, it's kind of fail silently, right? Like you broke a rule and it doesn't work, but like you don't really know why, you know, it didn't work. Is there any troubleshooting tool or, you know, any um, kind of somewhere where you can check whether at which place you've broken, you know, what rules and, you know, how you get over that? I think that in one of the slides that I was showing how you can select, for example, one primitive and then in another pane it would tell you where opinions were authored in what layer. So sometimes we forget about everything else than the viewport and the scene graph, but look at your uh, at the uh, properties, look at the layers. As you select element in one pane, other things will highlight. Show up the legends, they're like tooltips and they can tell you what are the different color coding. So this is essential to troubleshoot. And then as you get more familiar, uh, maybe with the documentation, read, read the whole side effects and USD, like glossary or terms and concepts, read those pages and really look at, uh, at those other paints. They, they give a lot of information. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, um, have you done any custom kinds for like stage traversals or anything to? No, uh, you can you can edit that. Uh, there's an API for it, but so far I kept the components because for the the needs of my productions, uh, components, groups, and assemblies are are enough. When you created the models, it was at the import that it creates the model, right? So, so the model is more of a, a concept. So because you created the component, the component is a kind, and the kind is something that can only be, it's a metadata on models. So you don't actively create a model. It's just that for your component or group to be valid, you have to follow some rules, three rules. Uh, and Solaris helps you respect those rules. There are a few things to keep in mind, but when I was referencing in a component, which if you only sublayer or reference at the, the root of the scene will always be valid, if you referencing if you reference it in under another primitive, it might become not valid or invalid at this point. And if you run is model on that primitive, then it will return false. And, and I guess my question is that th there's a node that allows artists to import a bunch of, a bunch of assets. Oh, uh, the stage manager. The stage manager yeah. Does that follow these rules? Can you? Yeah, the stage that? manager should always create a group above the uh, component that you import. Thanks. So about half of this room uh, uses USD in production currently, and the other half looked like it didn't uh, yet. Um, 
what would you say is uh, your sort of favorite part of working in the USD environment as somebody who's transitioned to it within the last few years? Um, sparse edits, uh, having the ability to, for example, the animation caches was a good example, right? You, you don't have to re-export everything as uh, I used to be an FX artist and sometimes you do CFX work and you have to re-export the whole character uh, because you did some CFX on, uh, on a shirt or something, but now you can only export the shirt. It's not that it was not possible with Elmbic, it's just that depending on your pipeline, it might not, uh, it might not have dealt with that gracefully, but USD is graceful with sparse edit and uh, like incomplete definition that compose together. So it really, it, it makes collaboration easier. Other questions? All right, LP, thanks so much.